My bachelor's degree is in organizational management studies. To some, it is a miracle that I'm in seminary and working in ministry. And to others, it's hilarious. I think it's a little bit of both. When I started my journey with seminary, really as early as even the day I got my acceptance letter, I took a long look in the mirror at myself and I said, are we sure about this? You didn't pay more than two seconds of attention in world history in high school, which was about as close as you get to any of the material you'll be learning. Are you sure that you have the background or the type of brain for this type of education? The truth is I didn't, I absolutely did not. <laughs> my college degree trained me to understand how businesses were run, how to analyze data, negotiate contracts, and I think some game theory, whatever that means. <laughs> I knew that on paper, I didn't have a shred, a shred of qualification for this advanced education in religion and theology. But I also knew that I was called to try. The thing with a call like that is that kind of your only choice is to listen to it. You can ignore it, as some choose to do, but the call doesn't ever really go away. My first year at seminary was incredible because I knew that I came with so little prior education and knowledge or experience that I couldn't have even pretended like I knew what was going on. There was no way for me to fake it, and I loved it that way. There's something really freeing about knowing that there is simply no sense in pretending to be anything other than who you are because nobody would have believed you anyway. All of my attention was on the sheer joy I was getting just from learning because I had nothing to prove to anyone. The truth, which was as clear to me as it was to any of my peers, was that I was at the school because God had placed me there. I had nothing to do with it. My only job was to show up and use what tools had been, given, that had been given to me and trust that God would help me through the rest. I showed up each day, paid attention to the best of my abilities, studied to the best of my abilities, and the rest really wasn't up to me. My second year, this year that I am about to finish, encountered a few more obstacles. With me making it through my first year, I felt I had a reputation to uphold a reputation known by who I could never have told you. Nobody was paying attention to anyone but themselves, but I was sure that everyone was watching me all the time. And I had, some, I had to prove somehow that I was at their level or higher, that I was an influence they should all learn from, and that I was the example of everything everyone should be. Surely I was an expert in theology after only one year of learning. And I was ready to show the whole world just how excellent I was at my job. As I saw more and more positive results within my schoolwork and my vocational discernment the year before, receiving more affirmations towards what I felt called to do, I took that to mean that things were going well because, of what, because I was the perfect person for the job. Placing the focus on my behaviors and my work became crushing. As I placed more and more pressure on concrete examples proving that I was where I was supposed to be. What I failed to consider in my attempts to showcase some skill or expertise that I might or might not have had was that when my only goal was not actually doing the work or following my own call, but instead attempting to prove something to those around me, I lost sight of the entire purpose of the work itself. I forgot that I was not placed there because I was the perfect person for the work, but rather I was the person for God's work to be done through. We see this in Paul and Barnabas' behavior in today's scripture. Paul, formerly called Saul, was famous for the murder and imprisonment of Christians across Jerusalem, sparing no one and showing no mercy along the way, until Jesus interfered and showed himself to Saul, asking him why he was persecuting Jesus. Accepting this change in his heart, Saul changed his name to Paul and dedicated himself to spreading the news of Jesus to all nations. And that is where his ministry begins. However, his, despite his heart being full of the Holy Spirit and eager to change lives, his, his career in ministry was far from seamless. Paul finds himself in a bit of an unfortunate pattern with his ministry, 
as he seems to end his first attempts at evangelism, being run out of the city or worse. Paul faces imprisonment, torture. Even his first experience with ministry ends with people trying to kill him. Even still, Paul picks himself up, dusts himself off, unfazed by the crowd's utter hatred for him, and moves on to the next place. His level of ambivalence is honestly really admirable to me because I will be very honest with you, I would have quit after the first death threat. So it raises confusion to me when we see Paul and Barnabas' disproportionate reaction to the Lycaonians when they react to Paul healing the man who couldn't walk. Paul takes a page out of Jesus' book, seeing the man without the ability to walk and healing him right then and there. And the crowd responds by treating Paul and Barnabas as if they were Greek gods come down to earth in human form. They were utterly horrified by the expression of sacrifices and the prayers made to Zeus. Paul and Barnabas tear their clothes in grief, shouting at the crowds that they are mistaken and that the Greek gods are not who healed the man. The two are appalled by such an obvious mistake by the Lyconians saying, we bring you good news that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God. Paul and Barnabas don't hold back at all as they shamelessly point out this obscenity that they see from the crowd by their worship of Greek gods with judgment towards their practices. Paul and Barnabas were determined that by their behaviors and their actions, they would show that their God is the only real God. Their horror shows their need to convince or prove. I find it interesting that in a previous examples of Paul's ministry, Paul's response to criticism or ridicule or just simply disagreement is not to be insulted or offended, but rather to politely move on despite holding differing beliefs. He goes where he needs to go, shares the work of Jesus with those around him, and when they turn on him, which they repeatedly do, he just leaves. He does not stomp his feet and say, guys, I'm serious, you have to listen to me. He just goes and goes in faith, potentially never even seeing the results of his ministry, but trusting in God's power to work in the hearts of those in the world. To be truly liberated from the grip of expectations about results, Paul must put his definition of success in the hands of God so that God might define it. When he does not, and instead he defines success in terms of the number of hearts changed or conversions made, he crumbles under the weight of that expectation. While at one point he happily continues on his journey, unbothered by the angry mob chasing him off, he now stands horrified at the worship of other deities despite him obviously showing the crowd of what God is capable of. The difference is the focus of his action. When Paul's focus is on God and God's love, Paul is at peace. When his focus is on his own skill or his success, his response is to be in pain. At one point, he is focused on what he is called to do, to go to the place where he is preaching, to love, and to share the news of Jesus. But in this instance, his focus is to showcase or prove God's presence or power. And in this instance, Paul's focus on results or visible proof of change is causing him to suffer. Paul and Barnabas, in their albeit bold and judgmental statements to the Lyconians, makes one thing clear. We are mortals, just like you. <clears throat> Paul and Barnabas, two men who were commissioned for ministry out of a community who were much more impressive of teachers and prophets, they are only human beings. Their call was to spread the word of the Lord, not to have a 100% success rate. Their call was not to prove God's existence, nor was it to convince people of anything. Their call was simple spread the word of Jesus, and show the love of God by serving others. Through this work, hearts are destined to change, no proof or convincing necessary. There was no demand for certain results, no message from the Holy Spirit of, and here's how you know that it's working, but rather an instruction which the two of them carried out in faith. 
We are called to follow the instructions given to us and have faith that God's love will shine through the works we engage in. We are not called to keep a running tally of successes and losses and qualifications so that we might compare ourselves to one another in hopes of one-upping each other. I think I made about seven or eight attempts at this very sermon. This is my final attempt, mostly because I ran out of time. <laughs> my family is here today, and they'd never heard me preach before. So I've spent about the last month trying to compose the perfect sermon for them to hear so I could show off the progress I've made through this journey. I needed it to be educational, but not too luxury, and I needed it to sound poised, but not too preachy, and I needed it to be clear and wise, but not inauthentic, and have you all noticed that I haven't said one single thing about the message or scripture? I haven't focused a bit on the part of worship that you all show up for, which is the Holy Spirit. I had been so zeroed in on proving myself to my community that I had lost sight of everything I believe about a message like this, that it isn't about me or how I come across, but the truth is that someone will hear what they need to hear because God will take care of that. Some of you will go home today and remember words or phrases that I use in this message that I have almost no memory of using, and some of you will remember the parts of this that I am the proudest of. But regardless of what stays in our hearts, God will be the force changing this place and beyond. Our call every day is to love one another and to love the Lord. Having faith that throughout our journeys, as we live and move in the world and show this love to everyone, hearts cannot help but be changed in the process. There is no proving of the work of the Lord. There is only love. That love is the proof. We are called to love and trust that through our love, God will show God's self to all those who want to see it. As we've seen, there's no use in trying to prove it anyway. Amen. <laughs>